Hey friendlies, it's Carolyn and welcome back to my RV life. I recently had the pleasure and the honor of teaching everything I know about finding amazing free campsites at the Winter 2018 Rubber Tramp Rendezvous. a crowd of uh, 400 maybe 500 people I got to share with a lot of people who are just starting out and even some seasoned people uh, everything uh, that I have learned in the last two years about finding great boondocking uh, on public lands and so I'm gonna share that with you today because I know a lot of you wanted to see it and you couldn't be here and we shot video and I put that together for you uh, it's in two parts today's video is gonna explain what boondocking is exactly where you can boondock I'm gonna give you all kinds of information about all the different types of public lands that you can camp on for free and then I'm going to talk to you about best practices and rules and regulations and how to make sure you're doing it legally and then the second video is going to be all of the tools that I use and all the tips and tricks that I have learned along the way for finding the absolute best free camp spots in the country in my opinion all right so here's the video <laughs> How many, oops, is that too loud? How many of you know the phrase, be happy, be free, be kind? <laughs> Me cry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, really. Let's start off with how many new full-time nomads do we have in the audience today? Yay, congratulations for being out here. And how many are soon going to be full-time nomads? Awesome. And of all of you who are new or soon to be nomads, how many of you dream of your perfect nomad life of being in a crowded RV park? <laughs> Yay, we're in the right place because me neither. My name is Carolyn. I have a YouTube channel called Carolyn's RV Life. And about two years ago, I decided to leave my life in the San Francisco Bay Area, business that I had built and a life in the rat race because I wanted to be closer to nature breathe. It's been a long time since I've been in front of a real audience. It's very different with a camera. I decided I wanted to be closer to nature. I was, I'm a backpacker, I'm a hiker, and I just didn't want to live that hectic life anymore. So I bought a 23-year-old RV. Anybody know her name? <laughs> and Matilda and I traveled across the country for uh, the last two years finding amazing free places on public lands to camp. And so how many of you are currently or are going to be full-timing in something bigger than a van? And are, are you a little afraid that it might be harder to find good boondocking in, in a bigger RV? So 29 foot isn't huge, but it's big enough. And so I'm here today to, to give you some of my tips and tricks and things that I have learned along the way for finding amazing boondocking spots on public lands. Hey there, so this is where we had some difficulties with the sound, so I'm gonna go ahead and try to recreate what I said in the next few minutes of the seminar. I wanted to give a definition of what is boondocking so that as I go through the ins and outs of boondocking and the tips, we're all on the same page and we all know what we're talking about. So for me, boondocking means that uh, going out on public lands and camping without services, dry camping, right? You're fully self-contained, you've got everything you you need you're not gonna have hookups you're not gonna have water you're not gonna have showers you're not gonna have toilets so boondocking literally is just going out and camping without services on public lands for free and you can do that on national forests you can do that in BLM lands you can do that in some state forests you can do that in some Army Corps of Engineers areas you can do that in wildlife refuges you can do that in fish and wildlife areas you can do that in some conservation areas and you can also do that in some utility districts so if you are out and about and traveling around I'm gonna to get to resources in the second half of this talk but 
if you are out and about and you're looking around and you want to find a free place to camp, these are all things that you can plug into Google. And the official term for it, so what you're going to be looking for, you're not going to find boondocking on BLM land on their website. It's going to be called dispersed camping. So dispersed camping is the official uh, name of what we do, of what we call boondocking. And it really is just being able to go out and travel down, especially in the West, any BLM road and call it home for two weeks. <laughs> and we're gonna get to the rules here in a minute. So that's how I define boondocking, coming out here dry camping on public lands. Before I went to the East Coast over the summer, I heard a lot how challenging it was on the East Coast, and it is a lot more challenging, I'm going to admit. And a lot of the freedom that I had taken for granted in the West just wasn't there. Literally, in many national forests here, and especially in BLM land, uh, you can just travel knowing the rules and keeping in mind the limitations and things like that. You can literally just travel down any BLM road and find a, a cool little nook or cranny and call it home. It's a lot harder in the East Coast and that's partly because a lot of the national lands are were bought uh, around existing families farms right people have been there a lot longer they settled the land a lot more than the West and the federal government decided that they wanted or even the state decided they wanted to start preserving land they started buying land around these farms and grandfathering them in so there's a lot more private property in national forests especially and in public lands so you can travel down a road in a national forest and think oh this looks really good and then five miles down the road, there's a neighborhood, sometimes even a little community and maybe a post office. I mean, it's very strange. Uh, so the I, what I found east of the Mississippi is that there is dispersed camping, but it's often most of the time in designated areas. So there will be free campgrounds. Uh, I found in, I think it was Tennessee, Sitico, Sitico Creek area, that you could disperse camp out there, but you had to do it in designated sites. They had like 10 sites. You didn't have to sign up or anything. It was first come, first serve, but you could only camp in one of those designated sites, and they were actually numbered. And I think there was a place in Virginia like that, too. They were actually, it was beautiful boondocking, actually, but they were numbered sites and pretty well used. Uh, I also had some pretty good luck with horse camps, as you know, in the uh, in the East Coast. And I heard in my seminar that some people have gotten kicked out of horse camps for not having horses. But everything I read at several of the ones that I went to in the East was that you didn't have to have a horse. And uh, what I said is, you know, you basically probably just wouldn't want to go there like on Memorial Weekend, Fourth of July, when it will be crowded with horse people. But I had the one in Kentucky all by myself for two weeks, and nobody cared that I was there without a horse. There was nobody else there uh, so those so that's my definition of boondocking and what I'm going to be talking about through the rest of this talk in uh, how to boondock where to find boondocking and uh, most importantly next is uh, the rules for boondocking we want to make sure that we stay within the limitations and the rules and the guidelines uh, so that we can preserve this for everybody so let's get back to the live seminar <laughs> without roads but I actually found a wilderness in the Ozarks that did have a road going through and I was able to boondock there so sometimes you might want to look for wilderness areas and then fish and wildlife so these are all areas public lands that you can be keep an eye out for wherever you're traveling for potential places for dispersed camping or boondocking again not national parks and not Indian reservations <coughs> Indian reservations sometimes allow you with permission, but you have to contact the tribal office and you have to get special permission. Um, I believe in honoring their land and would never tread on that land without permission. So those are the two places that are, you're not gonna find. And I also wanna make the distinction right now that boondocking, I think is not what I call stealth camping. I did do a video about a year ago about stealth camping and my definition of stealth camping is in a more urban area kind of flying under the radar in in a city or in a community or something like that and that's a whole different subject because it's oftentimes you're kind of on that gray line of legal and not or where you might get kicked out or what you can get away with so i'm not covering that today that's a whole different story that's what i'm going to mean when i talk about boondocking today so rules and regulations and how long you can stay and all that is in the next section any questions about boondocking what boondocking is or isn't yes 
How do you find utility districts? Google utility district or dis dispersed camping. And we're gonna get to some of the tools that I use here in a minute. And freecampsites.net is my favorite tool. And I'm gonna talk about that in depth here in a minute. But almost every single free boondocking campsite, whether it's in a utility district or BLM or uh, state forest, although I have found a few wonderful ones that aren't on there, um, are, you're gonna be able to find on one of those tools. So we'll get to that in a minute public lands rules and best practices. I'm gonna give you some generalizations about rules across public lands all across the country, but they are vast generalizations. I have seen differences in rules on public lands, especially national forests that vary greatly from state to state. But it's really important before you set up camp before you travel on any road um, i highly suggest looking at the website of the national forest that you're going into we pretty much only have blm in the west but i haven't seen a lot of differences in rules on blm and i'm going to cover those in a minute but national forests state parks state forests conservation areas national refuges army corps of engineers your rules are going to vary very greatly not only by state but by region by park ranger district make sure you know what the rules are before you go into any public land and the best way to do that in my experience or in my opinion is just to look at the website and when you look at the website, you might see one national forest, and I'm thinking again, El Dorado National Forest, it's broken into like five different ranger districts, and each ranger district has different rules. So you're gonna need to know which district you're going into, and you're gonna need to know what the rules are for each district. And the rules vary, the rules such as how long you can stay there. For example, national forests, some say you can stay there 14 days, and then you need to move. Well, how far away do you need to move? That varies. I've seen you need to move five miles away. I've seen you need to move 25 miles away. I've seen um, you need to, you can't come back to your original site for 21 days. I've seen you can't come back to that site for 365 days. So that means once a year, you are only allowed in a certain spot. And that was, I was actually when I was researching this, I just happened to pull up a uh, national forest in uh, Utah. And I, Utah or Idaho, one of them. And I would have never known. I've never seen 365 days. So check the website, again, under dispersed camping or in the little search bar, put dispersed camping. So the, the biggest rules that are gonna vary are how long you can stay in one spot, how often or how far away you need to move. And again, I've seen five miles and I've seen 25 miles. El Dorado National Forest, for example, they say within that national forest, you just need to move to another ranger district. So in, in the ones that say like 25 miles, which is most common, 20 or 25 miles, and you need to be gone for 21 days from your original spot. That would, need, that would mean you'd need a 50 mile radius. So you're in camp one, you move 25 miles to camp two, for 14, you're here 14 days, you're here 14 days, 14 days, days later, because you can't go back here for 21 days, you need one more camp 25 miles away. So you need a, that is a 50 mile radius, right? Yeah. So you need a 50 mile radius, three camps, if you want to stay in one area all the time and you can legally get away with that, okay? Diameter, Diameter. yeah. Whatever. Did I, what did I say, radius? Uh, <laughs> God, I love being corrected, thank you. <laughs> You guys watch me, don't you? <laughs> Thank you very much. I do appreciate that. I appreciate it. I need it or my brain would turn to slush. Another rule that's going to vary by region or by forest is how far away you can camp from a road. What's a road, right? You know, I've blocked roads before that didn't look like a road and lo and behold it was a road so you're really going to need to know and, and again this information is on most websites i think that the minimum i have seen is like 30 feet or 50 feet away from a road that you can go in and camp and i've seen as much as 300 feet so again this is mostly national forest i don't know that i have seen this in blm blm those rules mean that you have to park within 50 feet of a road to minimize impact when you are looking for a national forest to camp in and you want to uh, go disperse camping, that 50 feet from the road is going to mean that you need to be within 50 feet, within 300 feet of that road, not beyond. Okay. But I'm going to have Bob talk to you about 
how there's something uh, it's called a motor vehicle usage map and this is something that you can pick up at a ranger station that bob, i don't do paper maps or anything like that anymore i do all technology um bob is the paper guy so he's going to talk to you about this motor vehicle usage map which is actually a really good tool to have in any national forest because it's going to tell you what a road is so i'm going to let bob talk to you about that motor vehicle use map all these details, and there are a lot of little details about camping in the National Forest. All, they have, the National Forest once started a big thing, um, Travel Management Plan, TMP. And a major part of the, they, because they, mainly because the ATVs were destroying the na National Forest, and they needed a rule and a write-up and said, you can go here, you can't go here. If you go here, we're gonna stop you and fine you. But to do that, they had to have a way to tell you, you can go here and you can't go here. That's what the motor vehicle use map is all about. It tells you exactly which road is legal for which vehicle. And in nearly and every national forest in the country has a motor vehicle use map. And almost always there is a legend and it will tell you the rules of dispersed camping. And you can get these for free at any ranger station in the ranger district you are in. So find the ranger station, walk, get in. Uh, they usually have them in a big pile. I even seen them uh, in a big pile outside so that uh, you can just get them without even going into the building. Uh, and you can also download them as PDFs. Uh, it's a little complicated because the ranger, there might be 10 different elder, uh, well, it wouldn't be 10, but there might be three or four or five ranger districts of the same ranger uh, air, uh, national forest and so you would have to download them all or know which one you were going to uh, so anyway that's a little complication you can you can download these and in the um and in the uh, legend is almost always the rule of which road you can camp on and the rules 100 uh, like like carolyn said some of them you can't be over 100 feet away or 300 feet away or one vehicle length away that's actually becoming more and more common so if you have a van you can be 20 feet off the road if you have a van and a 30 foot travel trailer you can be 60 feet off the road or whatever that adds up to be and so uh, they will tell you that it will tell you um, how far you have to move in the miles and all those things i will pass these around i you, i love these things they're very very helpful they're free uh, and I will just pass these around. You can look at them. And usually if some will tell you exactly uh, where you can dis disperse camp, most of them do not. If it tells you where you can disperse camp, that's the only legal dispersed camping in that national forest. Uh, and if you're not in there, he can technically uh, find you and, and make you leave. They never will find you. I've never, I don't think I've ever seen a fine. They will ask you, say this, he'll come in and say this is illegal. Here, I'll give you a map. This will show you where you can go camp. Uh, on, and I don't, I don't think these are all from the East Coast because that's where I just was and could lay my hands on. Uh, they will have dots along a line. And anytime you see a dot along a line, that means it's just legal dispersed camping. Uh, we'll spread that, go that one around that way when she's done. So uh, they're really useful. They give you all the information you need to disperse camp in one place. If it does not designate dispersed camping with the dots, here's what that means. You can disperse camp anywhere in that national forest you want. It will be their obligation to tell you you cannot. And the map is how you will say, Ranger comes in and says, Ben, you can't camp here. He says, well, you say, I've got the map and I, it never says I can't. You're covered. Uh, and he's not going to because he's following the rules and he knows the rules. So there you go, the MVUMs are really helpful. You can download them as PDFs or you can uh, get them in any ranger station. And I'll, I just gotta be really quick, so just a question or two, yeah. Website for the download. I just Google it, uh, I, that's what I always do. Uh, MVUM, PDF, uh, what's the ranger station? Tahoe Ranger Station, California. Ta Tahoe National Forest, California. And it'll pop up, it almost always just pops up. Now, there is no one website where they're all held. Each ranger, each national forest has them on its website. And so that's how you get them. So that, let me say that again. I'm going to go to the Nat Tahoe National Forest uh, next month. So I will do a Google search on Tahoe National Forest MVUM download. And, and it'll pop right up.
Okay. And you and you can get them anytime you want. All right. Thank you. So those are pretty much all the things that you're going to need to look for in a national forest when you're going into the national forest. Just make sure you look at the website, Google the national forest that you're in, make sure you know the rules. Uh, they, like I said, they are going to vary greatly by state, by region, by, by ranger district. BLM, most of the time, you the limit is 14 days um, on one spot, and then you need to move um, 25 miles away. So that example that I just gave you a few minutes ago, 14 days in one spot, move 25 miles away, um, and you can't go back to the original site for 21 days. Okay, so that's where you're going to need the 50 mile radius. Yes. I can admit my faults. I can do that. Um, the other, the other uh, rule for BLM, and, and I, I think this is good practice, and I think it is probably even recommended, if not um, a rule, is to always try to camp in an established campsite. Um, who here is familiar with leave no trace principles? Any backpackers? Yeah, and I'm going to talk about that because that's something that's very near and dear to my heart. But we try to practice leave no trace principles, and that means that when we are treading on public lands, tread lightly. And that means when possible to camp in established spots so that we're minimizing our impact on the environment, on the, on the wildlife, on everything within that ecosystem, right? Um, same with backpacking, you know, they don't, don't tread on fresh grass, don't run over bushes, don't chop down trees, don't run into trees, don't, um, even uh, on the East Coast, they said don't even um, hitch your horses to trees, they put posts up there. So try to camp in established sites, of course, pack in what you pack out and leave a site. We all do this, right? Leave your site cleaner than you found it. And for those who dispose of their waste into the earth, um, that means, for, for in case you aren't familiar with the, the, the technicalities of leave no trace, a cat hole is supposed to be six to eight inches, no more, because six to eight inches is where it decomposes the best, and at least 200 feet from any water source. Okay, so these are all things that we can do to protect the ecosystem and the lands that we all love so much so that when we all go out and enjoy it, we're not literally stepping in other people's poop, which I have done. It's disgusting. So six to eight feet, you know, six to eight inches down, at least uh, 200 feet from a water source. Um, one other thing, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get a little preachy about leave no trace. Um, protect our water sources. Anything foreign that you introduce into a water source into an ecosystem can damage it. Even so-called natural soaps. If you're introducing peppermint Dr. Bronner's into an ecosystem that doesn't have peppermint Dr. Bronner's, you are disrupting that ecosystem. So for leave no trace, if you're going to be using natural water sources for washing, for bathing, take off, wash your sunscreen off, wash your, whatever is on your body, wash it off and carry water from the stream 200 feet away to your camp, do your washing, do your bathing. Does that make sense to everybody? We want to protect this. We want to protect the fish and all the frogs and all the things that are in these, in these natural resources so that they're there for us and they're there for future generations. And that means being really mindful about what we're putting into the water. And unfortunately, the natural soaps have uh, given us the false idea that it's okay. And, and I don't think it is okay. Leave cleaner, leave no trace. I think that's it. Any questions about rules and regulations? All the way in the back. Uh, you don't need permits in most national forests. Some of the utility districts, some of the state forests, uh, some of the conservation corps, you do need permits. And so it's a good idea, some of them, not all of them. So again, it's best to do your research before you, before you go off venturing into any public land. In the pink shirt and then I'll get to you. You pitch a tent. Um, outside of that 50 feet limit and uh, an experienced boondocker here is telling me that yes you can pitch a tent but your vehicle needs to be which makes sense your vehicle needs to be within that 50 feet any other burning question one more rule yes there. you're not having to try to find one of those guys with a little mobile thing no. flag and no you don't need to find anybody you don't need to flag anybody down and say look I'm here you know count start counting you don't need to do that but uh, again you know I just I hope that we can all you know I don't think a lot of us don't really like 
like rules, but I hope that we can all just kind of be mindful and think about our impact and, and, and treat these rules and the land appropriately. There are also LTVAs, if you long-term visitor areas in BLM lands, and those are kind of more designated, like I talk about, like you see on the East Coast, those are kind of more designated, they're dispersed but there are areas that you can actually pay and you can go camp there. But I just heard that there is just a regular big old BLM land out in, uh, and again, the heavy populated areas, you're gonna have more rules than you're gonna have in some of the more remote places. And out near uh, Parker and Lake Havasu, uh, you do need to get a permit and, um, and enforce the 14 day thing. Thank you. Okay, all right. So who wants to talk about how to find good boondocking spots? All right. That ends part one of this video. And next time I am going to bring you my best tips, tricks, and practices for finding what I think are some of the best free camping spots in the country. I like to say that in my life I get million dollar views uh, absolutely free. And my next video is going to share all of that information with you that I've learned along the way. If you are watching this video real time, the day I put it up, it will be up in a couple days. If you are watching the video at a later time, just click up here and also at the end of the video to see part two. And for those of you who are watching it today, I'm putting it up, there will be a giveaway in the next video. I'm going to be reviewing an item that I think every boondocker has to have on board in their RV, motorhome, or rig, and I'm gonna be giving one of those away. So be sure to tune in for part two of this video series of how to find the best boondocking, the best free camping in the country, absolutely free. And definitely check out a great product that I think everybody can use and enter for a chance to win one of your own. So thanks for hanging with me again today. I will see you next time. In the meantime, be happy, be free, and be kind. Mwah!